Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kemper Museum's virtual programming for Diani Whitehawk speaking to relatives, talking to her artist's eye with Norman Akers. Norman Akers was born in Oklahoma. He is a citizen of the Osage Nation from Gray Horse District. He received an uh, BFA in painting from the Kansas City Art Institute in, eight, in 1982 and a certificate in museum studies from the Institute of American Indian Arts in 1983. In 1991, he received a MFA in fine art from the University of Illinois. Akers has had solo exhibitions at the Lawrence Art Center, iSpace in Chicago, and the Gardner Art uh, Gallery in at Oklahoma State University. He has participated in numerous group exhibitions, including Monarchs, Brown and Native Contemporary Artists in the Path of the Butterfly. In um, 1999, he was a recipient of the Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptures Grant. Akers uh, previously taught painting and drawing at the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And in 2009, he accepted a teaching position at the University of Kansas, where he is currently an associate professor of painting and drawing. Kemper Museum would like to thank Jack and Karen Holland for their support of the Visiting Artists Program. Their generosity makes it possible for Kemper Museum to continue to have thoughtful and engaging programs in conjunction with our exhibitions and projects. Thank you to our Kemper Museum docents who offer so much of their time and expertise in interpreting the exhibitions and permanent collection with such great... Sorry, I apologize. My internet was acting weird and it said I muted myself. A special thank you to those who supported the exhibition, the Yanni Whitehawk Speaking to Relatives, Kemper uh, Family Foundation, National Endowment of the Arts, and the Museum and the Missouri Arts Council. Kemper Museum is sponsoring this program in partnership with the Missouri Humanities Council and with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and many others. And a warm thank you to our Kemper Museum members. Your support of our museum helps to make all of our exhibitions and programs free. If you are not yet a member, it's easy to sign up. You can visit our website at www.kemperart.org. Thank you, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Norman Akers. And please feel free to type all of your questions into the chat or the like question and answer section, and we will answer those after um, the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. As I said, I just wanted to, uh, I'm gonna go into screen share real quick. Um, I just wanna thank uh, the Kemper Museum and, um, and Deonnie Whitehawk, um, you know, for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to speak today. Um, one of the things I, I would like to sort of say in my introduction here is, is that um, I had an opportunity, I first met Deonnie back in probably night or 2007, 2008, when she was a student at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. And, um, and one of the things that I sort of remember about her was is that she just had a really incredible work ethic and, and you know, always, you know, brought things to, uh, to the conversation um, and, and, and questioned things, which was really good. And as I said, it was always a joy to, to, um, to work with her. Uh, and one of the other things I always like, I wanna talk a little bit about just II in the beginning because it's a shared experience, I think for both of us. Um, and that is that II is really, you know, kind of one of those special institutions. It was, um, it's the only tribal college that's devoted to fine arts. And, and it was established in uh, 1962 and, uh, what has always sort of struck me about II is, is that it's, it's educated and it's created a place for, for native peoples, native students, young people to, uh, 
to go and make art and to express themselves. And what I've always found about it as an older person, instead of looking at younger artists like Diani and others, is, is that, that each generation that comes to IIA has a vision. And it's a place where they begin to, to, to express that. And one of the things I, and it, as I said, that's the, always the thing that caught, caught my attention about the place is I reflect back on my own experience. I can remember as a student, you know, saying, oh boy, we gotta find a voice, gotta find something to say that we're slightly different. It's a different generation, but we all share that kind of same experience. And so, you know, thinking about that, is, is, is I think about Diani's work and as a former instructor, I'm so proud of her achievements. I mean, one of the things is, is I think, you know, as I look back and, and I see students like, like Diani, is, is that, that I realize is that their vision is changing the world for future native peoples and artists. And as I said, you know, this is, you know, such a joy to be able to talk you know, about, about her work um, and also just share some insights, you know, um, you know, today on some of her pieces. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide here. I had an opportunity to visit the show last week and um, and walking through the gallery, I was sort of taken by the sheer amount of work that she, she's completed in the last number of years. But uh, when I walked into this particular gallery space, um, it really caught my attention. And there was something about this particular room and this particular view that, that, uh, that just was sort of inspiring to me. Because of what I realized that, you know, you know in this piece called Carry Three, you know, it's just a nice mix of sort of traditional sort of art forms and also a very contemporary expression. Um, and some of the things that I'm gonna talk about today too are, are just gonna be sort of my take, my sort of interpretation, you know, on looking at uh, Diani's work and also, you know, what sort of, again, strikes me first. I mean, one of the things I think as an artist, I, I'm always sort of, um, attracted to that kind of immediate sort of response, that immediate kind of connection. And in this Carry Three piece, you know, what struck me about it is, is that in the installation, it, it's displayed in a way that it sort of is almost floating. And, and there's this very strong sense of almost like earth and sky, you know, and if you're on closer investigation, you realize that it's a copper bucket and a ladle. Uh, and that buckskin fringe that, that sort of moves down to, to, the, to the stand there, you know, really sort of shows its connection back to, uh, back to earth or ground. And, and that sort of relationship between earth and sky is something I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the other piece behind it, uh, um, again, you know, uh, stealing the forces back. Um, you know, is, is another piece that I think really sort of speaks to that notion of um, abstraction, you know, indigenous abstraction and also, you know, modernism too as well. And of course, in the far back we see, and which is sort of interesting in this slide because we see the, the images of the women uh, in the back. And, and I think Diana said this and spoke about, you know, indigenous women, you know, and, and their voice and their power. And, and, and I think all of these elements are, are very much, you know, sort of a part, part of uh, the show that, that I found really, as I said, really quite exciting. Um, it, it's, as I said, it, it's a very moving exhibit to go through and, and to look at. And I think one of the other things that you start to realize, too, is, is the, the sheer amount of work and effort put into this. Um, I'm going to move on to another image here. Uh, stealing horses back. This was a piece that kind of just immediately caught my attention. Uh, uh, in part, that that it has that aesthetic, you know, of um, of uh, of abstraction. We see the beadwork, and we see the the oil painting there, and and it's almost like 
there's two different types of abstraction that are being explored in this. One is this sort of indigenous uh, abstraction in the sense of beadwork, you know, the black and white, you know, sort of seed beads that are uh, stitched onto the canvas, you know, show this incredible effort, but also at the same time, you know, we're, we're getting, uh, you know, the painting, you know, and, and, and what I found sort of about this, that was, I like the title, of this piece, Stealing Horses Back. It was kind of like a statement of sort of reclaiming um, abstraction. You know, the thing about, you know, I think, you know, people should realize is that indigenous people have been dealing with abstraction, you know, for, for years in the art form, long before modernism became sort of a, a word in, um, you know, in, um, in visual art history, you know. And, and so, you know, when we think about you know, abstraction, indigenous people, you know, really sort of synthesize complex ideas into, um, into, uh, into abstract symbols. But, but this particular piece, as I said, I, I just found a sense of kind of humor to it. I mean, that notion of sort of reclaiming or again, taking back. And humor is such an important part of, I think, native culture um, as well. Um, one of the other pieces that I'm going to move on to here real quick, uh, Untitled Blue and White Stripes, The History of Abstraction. You know, and while this work sort of echoes, you know, elements of, um, of say, Sean Scully, uh, at the same time, it, you know, it's, it's very much, as I said, um, you know, an Indigenous statement, you know, here. What I respond to about, as I said, about these pieces I mentioned a little bit earlier, is that kind of relationship or that interaction between between uh, indigenous and Western art? And I think that's one of the things that that native artists consistently kind of have to deal with. You know, in, in many cases in the past, we've sort of been compared, uh, and, and yet indigenous aesthetics and indigenous art has it has its own, and, and it's so important. You know that that people begin to to start to look at our work, you know, on our on sort of our terms, in many ways, and particularly with this piece, as I said, it begins to speak to that uh, the sense of material, the the beaded stripes on top of the painting, you know, is such a nice sort of uh, you know contrast, you know, in the this particular work. Another piece in the exhibit, uh, Connections. Um, and, and something that, as I said, kind of caught my attention about this piece was, uh, was you know, we see this, the two sort of moccasin vamps. You know, we see the, again, the symbols, you know, that, that Dion is using, um, the, the dragonfly symbol, uh, that kind of four direction symbol that's beaded on the red moccasin even like the notion of the red and the blue. I mean, those colors are very important to Osage people too, as well. So, so I find I, I really begin to kind of relate, you know, you know, to that. Uh, but also at the other side, you know, one of the things I think it's so important about looking at indigenous art is, is too, is that while these symbols are, are there and you may sort of recognize them or understand them for what they are, there's many sort of different layers you know, into the work. And, and even in this piece, you know, we sort of see these moccasin vamps being set up like this, where they're, um, where they're, they're sort of, we're looking kind of, they almost feel like people in a sense, uh, kind of slightly personified, but yet the, the openings there. Uh, and to me, it's like, as I'm looking at them, the openings are, are sort of this kind of, interesting space because because it's like it, it's another layer to sort of go through um, it's kind of slightly dark but yet at the same time it's it's not off-putting it's inviting you know so in a way it's like the doors are sort of open to, to kind of yeah, to kind of be engaged into this kind of conversation um, and as I said this is uh, listen, let's, let's move on here um, Untitled, Quite Strength 3. Um, this whole series of Quite Strength paintings, um, you know, 
is is an, is is good in the sense that it begins to honor. And I think about particularly how, in a way, the, the laborious effort of uh, of painting in all of those little marks to create that that pattern that design you know, in the painting, um, you know, it's as equally as laborious as beadwork. And, and yet the painting, when you look at it, it, it does start to kind of suggest um, uh, bugle beads or even sometimes maybe dentalium, you know, for the most part. But, but as I'm looking at that, you know, one of the things that catches my attention is, um, is really just that sense of, um, of effort and time. And Something that I always kind of tend to think about is, is like, is that connection back? And, and, and I know Diani does this with her work where she's looking at beading and, and beading is an activity, you know, that, 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 that people partake in. And one of the things that's always struck me about uh, beadwork is the fact that, it, um, that it's made with love and it's made with care. And the person who's making the piece has good sort of intentions and thoughts, you know, in the process of making it. Uh, and many times, the, those those objects or those items you know, are, are given to people, and 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 people that that the artist sort of cares about. And as I said, it's a way of honoring. And, and when you look at particularly these paintings. There's that kind of level of intensity to them, but also there's a calm to them. And, and, and it really sort of speaks to that notion, <clears throat> you know, of honoring uh, people and honoring indigenous women, you know, and looking at that and being aware of that, again, that sort of quiet strength. Um, and, um, I'm going to shift a little bit here and, um, and talk a little bit to you about some of the work that I'm doing uh, and also talk about that kind of connection back to, to Diani's piece. The other piece here, uh, Carry One, um, as I said, I alluded to, to that, the, that Carry Three in the first, uh, one of the first slides. As I said, it's just such a marvelous example uh, of beadwork, you know, and, and also it's very unique in the sense of the, of the fringe. And the fringe is what sort of, you know, uh, captures me about, about the piece. But also, you know, one of the things I keep on thinking about is how, how as artists, you know, and, and I know from my own experiences, I've been trained at an art institute very much in Western art. You know, and, and knowing our uh, Western art history, but also at the same time, you know, what we find is, is that many of us sort of work back and forth between traditional art, you know, and also fine art, you know, and, and that sort of notion of division of craft and fine art, I think, is, is sort of problematic, you know, that, that kind of labeling of things that, that is just simply art. You know, and, and in many ways that she she begins to uh, 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 to sort of play with those notions, you know, in these these particular pieces. Um, you know, when I was asked to do this talk, I um, um, you know, I, I, I again, as I said, I was honored, but also, I, you know, when I was putting together the images, I, I it kind of gave me an opportunity to do something that I've never done before, in the sense that. Um, I, I tend to be a maker too. I, I do ribbon work and bead work. And when I started seeing Diani's pieces, it, it made me think about that. And, uh, and the piece that's next to it right here is a Osage uh, ribbon work suit and a beaded vest that actually I made a number of years ago. And I find, you know, I still do, um, do a fair amount of bead work, you know, and ribbon work when I have time, but but usually it's it's for someone. It's for someone, you know, that I'm that I'm thinking about uh, for the most part. But but even laying these out and you start to look at them, uh, you realize that kind of level of abstraction, you know, that that's uh, that's you know inherent, you know, in the in the pieces here. 
One of the things I'd like to do is to kind of transition a little bit um, and talk about, again, some of my own work here. And one second. Um, I'm going to talk about a piece called um, uh, Okitsa, or actually, and sometimes it's referred to as Okisa, uh, a small town in, in Oklahoma. But Okitsa is the Osage word. Um, this particular piece is, um, is really uh, is a work that, that I did about 10 years ago that, that is really, in a sense, I think an embodiment of an Osage sense of place or land. Um, you know, um, in a lot of my work, you know, one of the things I'll say is, is that, that I've, I've done a lot of, um, I, I do a lot with maps. And as a child, I collected maps for years. And, um, and, and I was always looking at them and kind of imagining a place. And, uh, and particularly with this piece, uh, um, I, I find I, I started kind of revisiting the map again in that. Uh, in this particular work, you know, there's a, a very sort of layered meaning in, in the work that, that what you see is, um, is this, uh, this landscape, this physical landscape um, which is uh, which is rolling hills and grassland and, and something that that I usually talk about when I'm when I'm presenting on work is I talk a lot about place and I show images of home in that and uh, the Osage where we live at today is that southern tip of the tall grass prairie so so these rolling hills and tall grass is very much you know a part of where I grew up um, the other thing that you're beginning to see in this work is uh, this map. Uh, and if you take a closer look at the map, you see place names, you see Okisa, you see Nalogany, Pahuska, Great Horse, Hominy, uh, you see Kansas up there. Uh, um, and a lot of times when I'm working with maps is, is I start to think about, you know, the uh, the meaning that's sort of inherent in, in mapping and cartography is, is that mapping and cartography in, in many ways was used to, to sort of kind of displace us or to clarify you no know, land. It has a very sort of um, almost sinister history with indigenous people, you know, here. I mean, we, you know, most people would think of maps as, as sort of a, as being used to sort of guide you to a place or through a place, but, but also at the same time, maps are really a result of colonialism. Um, and even in when I'm dealing with maps here is, is that, um, that I, I like to modify them. I like to change them. I like to kind of uh, move things around a little bit. And a good example of this one is, is that the border between Kansas and Oklahoma uh, is gone. It's basically been been removed, and, um, and and part of that is is that Osage traditional lands really extended up into uh, to uh, southeast Kansas, a, a majority of Missouri, and northwest Arkansas, as well as um, northeast Oklahoma, and, and so removing that boundary or that 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 uh, uh, is sort of my way of kind of acknowledging that. Also, one of the things too, as I, I am working, is I, I do a lot with, um, I, I look at um, Osage stories, you know, and some of our creation stories, and, and the elk is a central figure in, in one of our stories, and um, about the formation of earth, you know, our dry land for us to live on. Uh, and the different elements of the elk actually are, are symbolic of different aspects of land. A good example might be this, uh, the back of this elk right here, symbolic of these hills, you know, here as well. And, and so, so I'm playing with this, this sort of mythic representation of land, the physical land. And then this map, which sort of suggests, which is another symbol, suggests this sort of colonialism here. And so in many ways, this becomes very much a um, kind of a, um, uh, an Osage landscape, you know, for today. You know, when I think about, you know, indigenous aesthetics and, um, you know, and, and clearly, you know, with, uh, with Diani's work, you know, we see this sort of indigenous aesthetics that, it, that it's very visible, 
you know, in, in, in abstraction and pattern and design. Uh, but also, you know, I, I tend to think a little bit more about, about too, you know, um, sort of philosophical, you know, issues that it's storytelling. It, it's just that, that even in a painting like this, you know, there, there's a, an incredible amount of sort of abstraction, you know, in the piece. Um, and, um, yeah. Gonna move on to another piece here. Um, what's sort of interesting about, I, I think, you know, some of our career paths, and, and I was, you know, I was thinking back on some of Diani's sort of uh, experiences in academia, starting out in a tribal college or a couple of tribal colleges before moving on to, uh, to, to Madison for her master's degree. Um, in a situation, that mine was almost the opposite. I went to the to the, the Kansas City Art Institute, uh, and then went to tribal, went to to the uh, tribal college at the Institute of American Indian Arts to actually study uh, and get a certificate in museum studies. So in a way, it was almost like two different sort of uh, two different sort of paths, you know. Here and. Uh, and, and, and I'll, I, I will sort of share this with you is, is that I, I do remember going to the Art Institute and, and coming from a rural community, um, I, I really didn't have any experience, that much experience going to museums. Most of the work that I saw was, um, uh, was in people's houses. So I looked a lot at, at you know, the, the, uh, the Kiowa Five, the Bacon School Painters, which is this flat sort of Oklahoma style of painting. Uh, and of course there was ribbon work and there was yarn work, you know, and bead work. And then also, you know, uh, your kind of standard Western painters like Remington and Russell. I, I always joke about it. My father was a fan of rodeo and he loved that kind of Western painting. And, and so that was kind of what my sense of the arts were before I went to the Art Institute um, in Kansas City. And, and what struck me about going to school there was this feeling of, uh, of not knowing, but also in a way trying to fit in. And, um, and I have to admit, I found myself actually drawing, you know, uh, at the Nelson quite a bit. It was uh, one of those things. That was the first big museum, art museum that I ever got to see. And, and I have to say, I was sort of enamored with Western painting. And, um, and as I said, this, um, and, and what you see in many cases in, in the roots of my work is abstract expressionism, you know, for the most part, you know, and one of the things I'll, I'll sort of say too is, is that, um, you know, when I think back at the early years of II, uh, some of the artists like T.C. Cannon, and, you know, Earl Biss, Kevin Redstar, um, you know, they all sort of started out exploring this abstraction in some of the early works. And it was very sort of linked back to abstract expressionism. You know, and, you know, and I begin to think about that. Part of that is, is that that is a connection back to this indigenous thinking you know, about making images, but also, you know, it was very much a, a point in time in art history. When you think about abstract expressionists and Pollock and de Kooning and Motherwell and, and all of these other artists, you know, from, from kind of that same time period. And as that, and I think as young people, we kind of gravitate, you know, and, and you know, each generation wants to be a part, part of their time. Um, as I said, my career path has been a little bit different in the sense that, that um, uh, I've sort of been engaged in academia, you know, for quite a while. And, uh, and in my own work, I, I've always been sort of interested in, in that relationship between um, storytelling, um, you know, um, uh, traditional stories versus sort of academia, you know, of how we balance out you know, how we sort of get this cultural information. And, and, and that's something that, that has, has always sort of kind of, um, I've always tried to use in the work. Um, 
one of the things I'll say is I participated in our lunch good dances ever since I was a small child. Um, there's been some times I've dropped out, but, but, but generally, you know, one of the things I've always been sort of fortunate enough to, to, to have in my life was to listen to people and hear them talk about things. And, and to me, listening has always been a really important part of life, you know, um, you know, and, um, and, you know, it's through this kind of collective experience that, you know, one's not born with traditional knowledge. It evolves over time, you know, for the most part. And so I'm intrigued with that kind of knowledge, but also I'm intrigued with academia. And, and one of the things I'll, I'll sort of say is, is that I remembered when I was in graduate school, um, I started looking at uh, some old Smithsonian uh, journals and, and I came across uh, two uh, ethnographers, um, Giorgio Dorsey and also uh, Francis LaFleche, who happened to be an Omaha man. And, uh, and I became very intrigued with their, sort of their, the information that I was coming up with. And part of this was, um, it was this sort of thing that I, I realized that um, I, and I'm going to show this image right here on the, uh, the Osage symbolic chart. I, this was collected by Dorsey back in the 1880s. And, and basically it's sort of this Osage universe. And, uh, and, and I started thinking about that and I realized that, you know, this is a part of who I am, but it was also very cryptic. It was very abstract. You know, Genesis was sort of the first creation story that I had heard, you know, growing up. And yet, you know, I kept on looking at the, this particular image. And what we see is a river, a cedar tree, the sun, uh, the moon. We see the Pleiades. We see these, uh, that red oak tree at the very bottom. And, I, you know, I wanted to make a painting of it. And I wasn't quite for sure how to do that. And so I ended up doing this big piece, which is about, I believe, 84 inches by 76, something like that. It's quite a large painting. It was one of the largest pieces that I'd done at that time. And it was just called Collision of Heavenly Structures. And it was really kind of about this conflict, you know, and, and working with that. I, I didn't feel that as an artist or even as an Osage person that I could paint it like that diagram because it felt untruthful because I, I didn't understand it really. And so to paint it kind of in this way where it was slightly chaotic, you know, and, and, and became, you know, sort of an important thing for me to, to think about. One of the other things that, um, that as I was looking at this diagram was is that um, I started realizing um, that if my grandma had looked at it and my father looked at it as well as i looked at it that each of us would have this connection back to this image we would have an understanding of it but that understanding would really be connected to this kind of the context of time that we were at you know at that point of looking at it and, and that intrigued me you know, and that kind of goes back to something I said a bit, a little bit earlier about students at II, is that each generation has a vision, you know, in terms of how they're looking at indigenous art and what they want to say, you know, is, is that through their art, you know, they're finding a voice and that voice again represents us. And as I said, this is, um, and so this was, um, you know, this is, I think, is, is something that's so important about, about, about indigenous painting today. Um, one of the other things, I'm going to move on here real quick. This is a, a piece called uh, Okisa. And, and again, you know, it, it, it's playing with that notion of, um, of, uh, of, of place. You know, we see, um, we see the, uh, the map. We see the physical landscape. Uh, you see that tree trunk. Uh, to me, it's like when I think about symbols and images, uh, uh, they don't mean one thing. They have a depth. And depending on the context of how they're used or how they're placed or positioned in a work, 
that that meaning potentially can change. Um, in this case, you see the tree trunk that's sort of suspended between earth and sky. And as I said, that was my first thing when I was thinking about Diani's pieces when I walked into the exhibit was that that relationship there. Uh, but yet, you know, in this you know painting, as I said, we we begin to um, we begin to um, that becomes more visible. Um, the thing about too is this is that I think a lot of these works and, and that kind of uh, that sense of being in between, um, at least for my work, I, I find earth and sky is so important. Um, and I think about dualities in many cases, but, but also this kind of sense of not being or kind of being between two places. I always worry about the, the, the you know, that, that term sort of walking in two worlds because it's sort of become cliche now, because I think with, with, how the world is today is, is that we're actually through technology we have this ability to experience almost these kind of multiple kind of realities you know the fact that we can get on the internet and we could do a zoom with someone say in germany you know or los angeles or chicago or kansas city or wherever but but anyway this particular piece you know um uh, is um um yeah is really kind of about that um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the printmaking that, that I was um, working on. Uh, this is an older piece called New Story. Um, and what you see is a sort of personal symbology that's being developed. Um, and you see the elk, you see the crawdad, the top, the, the weather siren, the sun, the lunchbox. And, uh, and for me, printmaking, is, um, is, is something that I've always enjoyed. And, and this is a monoprint. And one, if you're not familiar with the monoprint process, you know, basically you're inking up a, a plate and, uh, and then uh, putting the paper or written and running, running it through a press to get the image. Uh, and it, what always struck me about monoprints is that that first image never excited me. It was always kind of, uh, kind of boring. To me, for some reason, there wasn't the feel that I was looking for, and um, and so I started actually um, inking up these stencils that I was cutting out, and then dropping them back over, you know, that plate. And and sometimes you know, the second run through a press, you you, you might call it a um, uh, the ghost print. You know, in a sense. And so I was really interested in how the printmaking process sort of connected back to, to the past and the present, you know, and, and in many cases, when I'm looking at work is I'm thinking about how the past has sort of formed how I'm viewing the world today. But also I'm, I'm trying to find something that's very future oriented in, in the work. Uh, and so that kind of layering of time has been something that, that has been very very important to me, to me in the work. Um, a lot of my work, as I said, relies back on storytelling. Um, and this is a piece called Saint uh, Eustace's New Suit. Um, and um, one of the things that happened years ago, I was in Paris and I saw a, um, uh, a stone sort of relief and it was of a stag's head and a crucifix and it was on the back side of this church and um and it caught my attention and then later on i found out it was a uh, it was a symbol for the patron saint of hunters um and and i really was wanted to use that in the work and, and this is a, a piece that was really kind of almost like a warning painting, you know, in its narrative. You see the, the suit, you see a broken drum, which I, I was talking to some people at home. I said, that was really something that was hard to paint, you know, it, it, you know to, to paint a broken drum, you know, it is painful. And, but yet, you know, when you look at the painting, there's a Jarvik seven artificial heart. Uh, there's a casino in the background, and this painting was actually done before casinos really became a part of kind of uh, our culture at home. You see the arrows that have been dropped to the ground. 
And, and it's really about kind of a warning about adopting something new and, and leaving something, you know, behind. And, um, and very much, you know, this is, this is, um, is about that. Um, you know, this, this afternoon, I haven't looked, I haven't talked about this painting in, in years. And, and, um, and this afternoon, I felt like I had an opportunity to, to sort of pull it up and maybe chat a little bit about the work. This is called Sacred Structures. And when I was teaching at the Institute of American Indian Arts, one of the things that, that I found, you know, somewhat of a challenge here because, um, and, and I am very conflicted in, in many times because I think, you know, um, understanding how to draw, understanding how to paint, you know, uh, of knowing, you know, those sort of rules, you might say, um, are important, you know, if you're, if you're going to be teaching, you know, for instance, you, you need to know those. Uh, but when I was teaching at IIA, you know, I, I began to start to kind of question my own sort of background in instruction, um, you know, in, in the arts. And, um, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I totally love painting. And I think of myself as a painter. Um, and appreciate the history, you know, of art. But as I said, there are challenges there. And, and so I, I became really interested in this sort of visual space. Um, and one of the things that always struck me about Western painting was that um, sometimes the more real it looked, the more illusion it had, it was sort of deemed more valuable. Um, and uh, and then began to think about some of the uh, the uh, the sort of the fundamentals of visual art, particularly perspective, you know, and creating that illusion of space, and it's kind of connection back to the Renaissance, you know, and and how it was developed and used by Western artists, you know, in in painting, you know, and drawing, and uh, and so I had a an old photograph of a of a cathedral where we sort of see this this sort of perspective type space moving back and um and it was very much uh, and so i made a painting of it and then right on top of it i decided to paint this flat elk and do these linear drawings of again that osage universe and those flat sort of shapes that that sort of set on the top of the painting you know they were floating there but but they were also iconic you know, sort of images that 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 had a different type of visual space that suggested a different kind of origin, and I love that sort of contrast. You know, between the two, um, you know, in, in this particular painting, um, and it, it's still something that I find in the print work is is that that I like to play with this notion of illusion you know, in flat pictorial space as a means of kind of acknowledging both of those kind of, uh, kind of, um, you know, I don't want to say histories, but, but, you know, points of view about visual representation. Um, this is a lot of my work I deal with. Uh, I like to look back at old uh, printmaking. You know, and, and this was an image that, that I came across a number of years ago and just loosely titled The People on Island, which have been discovered. Uh, it was a German woodcut you know, around um, 1505, but it's also supposed to be one of the first um, um, ethnographically correct images of people from the New World. And, uh, and when I've looked at this work, it, it just kind of a, you know, the first thing that I have to say is, is that the composition is very Western, you know, in how everything's, all the, the figures are sort of organized. We see the two figures on, the, um, on the, the right that are sort of consoling each other. We see this sort of the, the leader figure, you know, with his hand kind of over his heart holding that, that bow, the mother and child, and, and we see this sort of almost a lustful couple in the background. And, and clearly there's references to cannibalism. And, um, 
and these feathered headdresses. And, um, and, and I said, within this print is sort of all the stereotypes of, uh, of, of, of indigenous people that Europeans have. And uh, it's all there, you know, in this, this early work. Uh, and yet, you know, I kept on thinking about what's really important about it. And, and to me, you know, it's really those two ships in the background and, um, and I was jokingly said one time, I said, that's at the point when we sort of discovered you all. And, um, and this is, a, as I said, is, is, is one of those prints. I've looked at a number of Debray's prints too that I've worked with in, in the past, but, but this gives you a sense of, um, you'll see this in a couple of other pieces here, one called Reconstructing um, Arrival. Uh, it's interesting. I, I don't think of myself as an overt political painter. Uh, I, I'm much interested in sort of bringing people into a work uh, and then having them sort of discover the meaning, you know, and in a sense, like how those two ships were sort of arriving, you know, in that old woodcut, um, you know, I start to kind of play with the notion of these distorted maps, borders and boundaries. But you've also got George Washington and Hamilton and Lincoln and Grant, who are sort of in these flying saucers, um, sort of as aliens floating around trying to find a place to land. And, um, and one of the things that I, that I always sort of aware of um, is I'm going to move on to another piece here. Uh, Dark Rain is, is that, you know, these pieces are about kind of borders, they're about immigration, they're about that notion of, of, of native and outsider, or, you know, uh, and I think people in the America, America kind of tend to forget that, that most people migrated here, you know, and one of the things I do think about migration is, and immigration is, is that, that most people move because they're trying to make a better life for their family. You know, and that's been going on for, for hundreds of years, you know, and, and so, so as I said, this is, this is sort of like kind of tongue in cheek way of playing with that. Um, let's show a few more pieces and then, then we can probably move to a question and answer. Uh, this is called Interference in a Tiny Spot of Hope, which is a fairly large painting that's, um, it's again, it's about this disruption, you know, uh, I find that that sort of horizon line between earth and sky important. A few years back, we had a whole bunch of um, um, windmills that were put up and, and, um, and this sort of landscape that I was familiar, have been familiar with most all of my life had changed. And, and these windmills in, from some points of view feel like they're sort of cutting into the earth and they're cutting into the sky. And that kind of disruption of that relationship between earth and sky, and particularly if you've grown up out on the prairie in the ro rolling hills, you see that. That's very important to you. Uh, and again, you know, the elk is flipped upside down. There's this sort of turmoil. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but, uh, but, but, uh, but you start to see bones and elements. And it's about really, again, about kind of the disturbance of land. Um, this is a piece that was done um, last year when COVID started taking kind of a hold of this country. And it was just called Crying Elk. Um, another work um, titled um, Dripping World. You know, again, looking at the pipeline. Um, I am finding that these works are really kind of dealing more with environmental issues. Uh, I'm going to move on to, to two more pieces, which were actually done last, well, January, just a couple of months ago. X-ray vision, which is Shinko Lei. And, uh, and then this final piece called Surrounded. And I think maybe at this point in time, I'll do stop share. And then if there's questions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them.
Wonderful. Thank you so much. This was so nice to hear about your practice. We have a few questions and please feel free to type any questions into the chat or the q and I'm checking both. The first one is I'm interested in the actual size of these works. Um, <clears throat> maybe uh, the sacred structures and then carry three. I can tell you carry three is 110 inches tall. Uh, sacred structures, I believe is about 48 inches by 44. <laughs> uh, I say that in the sense that I did that almost 20 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, but that's nice. That um, gives us a nice visual of the yeah. size. So thank you. Yeah. And then, oh, sorry. And then another question was, acorns are in many of your works. Why? Um, you know, the acorns come from that red oak tree. And, and that red oak tree is part of our creation story. And, and one of the things that, that I'll sort of say is, is that I'm not interested in illustrating these stories per se. I, I'm interested in how they can change and they evolve, you know, over time. Um, and, and so when I'm looking at those, those, those stories and I'm utilizing them in the work is as I'm finding certain things that I think can be future oriented. And so the acorn is a seed and it's about planting and it's about growing and it's about, you know, that tree growing again. And, and that's what's important for me is, is that within all of these works, um, as I said, it's about finding something. It's about trying to understand the world that you live in. You know, when you think about indigenous storytelling and, and narrative, um, you know, it's not just about entertainment. You know, it also functioned as a way to, to help us understand the world that we lived in, very much like science, just the opposite, you know, there. And, and so, so when I'm looking at working with acorns and I'm looking at working with that, that tree or, a, or those other visual elements that are part of the vocabulary that I'm dealing with, is, is that, that I'm thinking about how they sort of transcend that original meaning and how they potentially can move forward and they can help me understand sort of where I'm at today. Kind of going back to that diagram of that Osage uh, universe, as I said, when my grandma would look at it, my father and I look at it, all three of us would know we were connected to it, but we would see it a little bit differently. And so that's why the acorn is part of that. You know, it, it's about growth, you know. Uh, it's funny because I, mean, I was talking to someone a while back and I said, well, your work kind of deals with some hard issues and about disconnect and loss and, and that. But I said, it's also about hope, you know, there, and that's an important thing to kind of realize. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the next question is, when you create something, do you already know the meaning of the piece? Or do you create something and then the meaning comes to you um, out of some depth of remembering? Um, I start off painting. And the vocabulary of symbols that I work with have meaning that's associated with them. But I don't know where the painting's going. And, and while it may seem like they're, the pieces are contrived because I'm dealing with this vocabulary, I actually don't. And if I did know where it was going to be at the very end, I wouldn't paint it. Because part of, I think, making work is about getting lost. It's about not knowing. It's about this sort of unforsureness. And then when things come together, there's this sense of discovery, you know, and, and that's what making art is about. You know, I mean, art should teach you something. 
it should provide those moments of discovery in, you know, towards the end of the, the process. And, and that's what I'm looking at. So I don't necessarily think that, that it's about sort of, again, illustrating a story or anything. There are memories that sort of filter through the pieces, but they, you know, it, it's really, as I said, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, and, and, um, and yeah, I hope that answers your question. I was looking to see if there were any additional questions and it looks like there are some really wonderful thank yous um, for you, Norman. There's one from Diani, the artist for everyone um, here, Diani Whitehawk, and then a wonderful thank you from Foxy Khan and uh, Bailey. Oh, there is one more question. Yes. Okay, um, what symbol has most recently surprised you? Um, I started painting COVID symbols. I, I, you're not necessarily seeing it um, in, in that painting crying out, they were in there. They were just barely visible uh, uh, on, a, on, on a really closer sort of inspection. You begin to see them floating and occupying that space there. But, uh, but in some of the more recent work, I've, I've been playing with that. You know, and, and it's also sort of got me starting to think a little bit more about this notion of the invisible, the invisible world, which is something I've always been interested in because the prairie, I mean, when I think about being out on the prairie is, is that when you look out, you see this mass, this incredible sort of expanse of land. And the first thing to me is, is I realize as much as I can see, I think about how much I can't see because it goes beyond your physical eyesight, the limitations of what you can look at. But if you've ever walked through tall grass prairie and walked through that grass, you realize you can't see again because the grass obscures the ground, you know, and, and they're saying, and I have a deathly fear of snakes. So, <laughs> so, so I, I, I think about that, that kind of relationship, but, but, but no, that's, that's something that's new in the work. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And I'll have to put that on my list to be sure to visit tall grass prairie, <laughs> but to watch yeah. out for the snakes. <laughs> no, no, nah, but. It looks like there's one final question, and that sure. is what what is that text painting behind you? Oh, <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> oh, behind me? Yeah, so we can see some of your works like in your gallery space, but then we can also see that um, work that you'll answer. This is, this is about. so funny about Zoom. I, can you see? Yeah, this is great to see them like, you know, Zoom live, what, how I call it. <laughs> uh, we could do studio tours that way. But, but no, as I said, um, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I think the person was asking about the, is that Edgar Heap of Birds behind you on top yes. of the? Yeah, so the answer to that question is that work is an Edgar Heap of Birds. Yes. A trade from many years ago. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. A 
Okay, well, it looks like those are all the questions that are in the chat and we'll end the Q&A. And Norman, we'll be sure to save these for you so you can read the wonderful thank yous and everyone talking about how wonderful your work is. And thank well, you everyone for joining us. And Norman, thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation about your work, about Diani's work, about Native history and practices. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining Kemper Museum Programming. Well, y'all take care. <laughs>